I'm here today to announce that the program known as DACA that was effectuated under the Obama administration is being rescinded. To have a lawful system of immigration that serves the national interest, we cannot admit everyone who would like to come here. It's just that simple. In order for people to realize how important immigrants are, maybe the DACA program does have to end. We are all human beings who just want to live a better life for us, for our family, and for the community in which we serve. These are people. These are animals. They are being released by the tens of thousands into our communities with no regard for the impact on public safety or resources. This is The Pursuit. I'm Natalie Dowzicki. President Trump has never been shy about his feelings towards immigrants, but he's not the first president to be particularly cruel towards them. This is Cato's Director of Immigration Studies, Alex Narasta. He has put in place a large number of additional rules, regulations, higher fees, uh, more bureaucratic checks on getting a green card uh, through the regulatory process. So he has been totally unsuccessful in in getting Congress to pass actual laws to change it. So to give you an example, they expanded something recently called the um, public charge rule, which says – and it's been on the books since the 1880s – You can't be admitted to the United States, basically, if you're going to go on welfare. How the government interprets that, of course, is up to them. So what the president and his administration did was they basically said if a government employee who's doing the interview for a green card thinks that this person is going to go on welfare, then that's it. They don't get a green card. There's no formula. There's no nothing like that. There's a bunch of factors they can consider. But basically, if they think you're going to be on welfare according to whatever new standards they created that are, as far as we can tell, not uniform and not knowable, and there's no formula that we can take a look at, um, then they think that uh, you're not going to be able to come to the United States anymore. Trump has not only made it more difficult for immigrants to come to the United States legally, he has also made significant changes to deport those who are already here. This is Gabby Pacheco from the Dream.us. So in September 2017, the Trump administration said, we're going to end this program. Those that have it can keep it, but nobody else who could have applied or didn't apply before are eligible to apply. And those who can renew it can renew it and they have a month to be able to do this. And so it it sent chills down the backs of all these young people who were depending and are depending on this because they're going to college, they're working, they have families, they have children. Being able to have DACA allows them to be able to get driver's licenses uh, and other things that are really key and important to be able to live your life. And um, three different cases uh, were brought up to do an injunction to, to, in order to keep the program going. And the Supreme Court did hear the DACA case in November, and we're supposed to be hearing some sort of decision from them. In November 2019, the Supreme Court did not consider the legality of the DACA policy, but rather they were questioning the way President Trump decided to end the program. Yeah, so all the legal arguments, and this is why this is why I'm not a lawyer, right? Is that they're all like super boring legal arguments about one, did President Obama and the Department of Homeland Security have the authority to create DACA in the first place? And two, did President Trump cancel it lawfully? Did he conform with the Administrative Procedures Act, which is this act about promulgating regulations? Did he – because you have to promulgate a regulation to cancel DACA. So did he do that in the right way while he canceled it? And probably not. 
Um, doesn't seem like it. So they're basically taking their time and getting to this answer. It says no. So it's not at all about DACA. It's not at all about whether these people are deserving. It's not at all about whether we want them to be Americans or whether they contribute or whether they're more likely to be criminals or students or whatever. It's merely about whether the Department of Homeland Security and the Trump administration uh, dotted some I's and crossed some bureaucratic T's and whether the Obama administration uh, actually followed the law when they created this program. And, you know, it's, I think, anyone's best guess what's going to happen um, with the Supreme Court. My hope is that either they send the case to Trump and say, you know, you actually didn't end this program properly, which is what's being argued here, or that they throw it back to the, the lower courts for that to be decided there. And, and what will happen is that it will give us more time. The Supreme Court has rubber stamped everything that President Trump wants to do with immigration, just about. So the chances that they're not going to rubber stamp, not going to go along with this, is uh, very, very small. And I'd say the legal arguments, just taking a look at it, not from what I want to be true, but from what seems to be true, is much more difficult in this case than a lot of the other stuff that they've ruled in favor of the president. So what's going to happen to DACA recipients? I think the courts are going to have a period of time where the program is going to unwind. It's not going to be maybe canceled immediately, but over some months, it'll sort of wind down. People will have their permits canceled, and then they will be unlawful immigrants again. You know, I wonder what's going to happen when 40,000 teachers who currently have DACA in their classroom show up um, to the principal's office and say, you know, I'm sorry, boss, I can't come into work anymore. My DACA has expired. You have doctors, you have nurses, you have entrepreneurs, you have software engineers. You know, I remember in 2006 when they, the community came out and did the one day without an immigrant. And people talk about that and say, you know, like my pool man didn't come to work or, you know, all this construction uh, workers stopped coming to work and we couldn't, you know, move forward on, on the project and that held us back a lot. The other part of me honestly feels like in order for this country and maybe, you know, knock on wood, I'm wrong, but in order for people to realize how important immigrants are, maybe the DACA program does have to end. Most of America doesn't understand how truly difficult it is to be an immigrant in our country. I, I don't think they even have an understanding of what the current legal immigration system is. I mean, I suspect that most Americans, if you were to ask them to describe the legal immigration system, they describe something like Ellis Island, which hasn't existed really in any form that's recognizable for about a century. I think a lot of other people think that um, unlawful or illegal immigrants, no matter who they are, are basically all criminals by being here, and they don't like that. I think you also just have a lot of people who are scared of their own shadows. I speak a lot around the country about immigration, and um, I was in Arizona like five or six years ago, and I used to give this talk without sort of explaining what the current legal immigration system was. And, and this nice lady came up to me afterwards, and she said, I understand what you're talking about, how immigration is beneficial to the United States. So why don't all the illegal immigrants just go down to the post office and register and get a green card? And I realized... I think the majority of people in this country f believe that it's as easy to get a green card today as it was 150 years ago. I think that the biggest thing I like for them to understand about any immigrant is that we are all human beings with aspirations. And this is Kevin Ortiz, a former Dream.us scholar. And we are all we all wish to be free people living in a free society. We all wish to have a home. We all wish our family to be healthy and, and to live prosperous. We all wish to be able to provide education to our kids. And that is no different than all the Republicans in the Senate and in the Congress and all the Democrats in the Senate and in Congress, right? Or, or any individual living in San Francisco or in Texas or in Beijing or in, in, in uh, Bolivia. We are all human beings who just want to live a better life for us, for our family, and for the community in which we serve. 
Can you imagine living your life in two-year increments, not knowing when a paycheck could be your last, and no longer being able to provide for your family? This is the reality every DACA recipient will face if the Supreme Court decides in favor of the Trump administration. Every single challenge that we faced before relating to DACA, there is always this sort of feeling of like, okay, well, we're gonna come together, we're gonna organize, and we're gonna have a plan. And it always worked, and you always had this feeling of hope, um, even when Trump took office, but I'm not gonna lie and say that I don't feel scared because for the first time, I do feel like, once again, things are in my control. Now that this whole conversation of DACA landed in the Supreme Court, now we understand that, well, this is it. You know, we, we, we seriously cannot go any further than that. People that I've never met that don't know me are gonna have to decide my life. Even though many dreamers are trying to remain hopeful, for some, it's hard to stay positive. This is Iwa. The outcome of that case will kind of like change everything for me. Um, and primarily I'm thinking of, I don't know why, I'm thinking of my brother. The year that President Trump rescinded the program, um, that same month, like the month before, my brother sent in his DACA application. And once we heard that the program had ended, a week later, we got the letter back that he wasn't eligible, he couldn't get the program. And I was so devastated because I knew that it was only with DACA that I'm literally able to be here right now. So I didn't know what my brother's future would look like. So that case would um, really help my brother because right now I'm trying to help him apply to scholarships and he doesn't really qualify for much because he doesn't even have DACA. I mean, he's DACA eligible, but um, schools are classifying him as um, an international student and it really breaks my heart because he could have been where I am. I knew that it was up to us as immigrants to go out there and show who we were and, and put our face out there. And so we did the walk. Gabby and some of her friends decided they would walk for four months on foot from Miami to Washington, D.C., fighting for their right to belong in the country they consider to be home. It was beyond us trying to hold the president accountable. It was also us trying to put a face to the issue, talk to people, and let our community know that as human beings, we have worth and, and we have power. One of the things that the trail, this walk, really showed me is the beauty of our country and the people. I think we were in South Carolina and we had a group of young people come out to, I guess, try to bother us. And these young folks came out with a huge Confederate flag. And instead of us, you know, getting upset or mad, we, we said, join us, walk with us, and let's talk. And we started talking and asking them about, you know, what this flag meant for them. And they just were talking about the South and this whole idea that, it's a symbol for them of who they are and where they come from. And then we started sharing with them, well, you know, this is also what the symbol means and this is what it feels for others. And having that conversation and going back and forth um, without us telling them, you know, put that away or whatever, they slowly, you know, folded the flag, <laughs> put it away in this book bag they had been storing it, and they continued to walk with us and ask questions. And, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the 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 time that they were with us, they gave us a hug and they thanked us for what we were doing. Some people just don't understand that immigrants are real people, just like you and I. In fact, many of our ancestors came to this great country as immigrants with a dream. And um, the DREAM Act has been around for now um, two decades. Immigration reform has come and gone through the, both the Senate and the House and nothing has happened. And, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, yes, as an immigrant, it's my responsibility to show the true character of who we are as a community and as people. But it's also up to you as citizens and those that don't necessarily understand, like you were saying before, you know, I don't know, you know, what it is to not have a driver's license. 
And so this is kind of like both a plea and an ask for the people who get and understand that we have to push, right? We have to show up for our fellow Americans, right? To, to make the change that's possible. And, you know, Congress and the Senate and Trump um, will listen to us, you know? And I think that, um, you know, we can do our part, but we need others. As a country, it's abundantly clear that our immigration system is disorganized and out of control. With many failed bills and loose policy directives, it's a difficult topic to tackle, but it can't go on like this. Like, so we are not islands onto ourselves, like undocumented families, immigrant families in this country. And that's the other thing. You can't really separate the undocumented people from the documented people. We live in the same family. So I'm Filipino. I live in the Bay Area where I, where I grew up. I have 34 relatives here in the Bay Area, 34 relatives. I'm the only one who's undocumented. Everybody else has papers. And the, and the irony there is I'm probably the most civically engaged and I'm the one without papers. To me, there's something really painful about that because unless you're Native American or an African American, you came here through immigration. So how can you ask people for borders and papers or why they're here if you don't even know how you got here? Jose is right. At one point or another, many of our ancestors immigrated to the United States in search of a better life. Many fled religious persecution and oppressive regimes. They too faced hardships upon arriving in the United States, but it's crucial to understand that we have not made the system any easier. The government just continues to determine who wins and who loses. If DACA ends and no relief plan is put in place, it will leave many hung out to dry. They will be unable to lawfully work in the United States. They will become deportable, just like every other unlawful immigrant. And it will be extremely uh, difficult for them. Alex believes that DACA is great policy and that the only fault it truly has is that it doesn't go far enough. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court is not deciding whether or not DACA is good policy. And Congress doesn't appear to be tackling our immigration system in a meaningful way anytime soon. And I, I don't want to be too pessimistic about it. Like, I'm not an expert in Congress. But just looking at it from this side, you know, from this vantage point, I don't see what our next move is. Great leaders are able to play within the system, through the system, outside the system. And that is what our immigrant undocumented folks are doing. They're, they're finding ways of working within the system, outside the system, through the system because they understand that it takes outside the box thinking to truly live a life in, 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 a, in a place that is not designed for us. Do we, do, do we wanna stand on the right side of history as far as doing the right thing for individuals who've been in this country for many years? Because if you think about it, anyone who has DACA today, they have been here at least 13 years, at least. 13 years is a long time. You make families, you have kids, you buy houses, you have cars, you have responsibilities that you just can't pick up and leave. No one should be expected to pack up and leave their life behind. Many of these immigrants consider themselves to be American. Some are probably more American than you and me. So maybe it's time for us to consider what being American really means. Thanks for listening to The Pursuit. If you like The Pursuit, please rate and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The Pursuit is a project of libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. Music by Cellophane Sam. If you'd like to learn about libertarianism, visit us at libertarianism.org.